everyone. It's just a wonderful morning to be together to worship the Lord. And so good to see all of you here. And hello to those of you online. And, and if you're watching or you're visiting us for the first time, we, oh, and my alarm went off. <laughs> trouble. <laughs> I usually check on this. <laughs> um, but if, if this is your first time here, we hope that you will feel most welcome. Um, we are so glad that you're joining us this morning. If you look on the back of your bulletins, there's a list of a lot of things that are coming up. And I was asked especially to let you know that we have pickleball this afternoon for all ages, church-wide. So that means all ages. You're welcome. Um, they've been really having a, a good time um, here every Sunday doing that activity. And um, this Saturday, we have trekking for treats. Um, so in the lower um, section of the church, um, there will be the different um, Sunday school classes are going to be having games and, and activities and treats for kids. And um, you're in, you and the kids are welcome to um, encourage to wear costumes <laughs> and attend. Um, but we hope that we will see you here on Saturday too. But before we worship the Lord together, I'm going to ask you if you're able to stand up and just take a look around and please say hello to those around you because we're so happy to see all of you here. <laughs> Praises, please sing this with us. Great is the Lord, He is holy and just, of His power we trust in His love. Great is the Lord, He is faithful and true, by His mercy. to be gathered together this morning to 
to just um, join together to worship you, to, to sing praises to you, to um, lift up prayers to you, and to, to listen and maybe hear your voice speak to us as Pastor Sterling um, presents our message this morning and presents from your word. And um, may we open our spiritual ears and hearts that we may hear that special message that you have for each one of us this morning. Thank you. We don't take this gathering for granted, Lord, when there are so many places in the world where they have to go into hiding to, to gather together to fellowship and to worship you. And you know, we have the freedom to do that every single, uh, every day, in fact, to, to worship you in public and to, to gather together. And um, we are truly, truly thankful for that freedom that we have. Father, just um, examine our hearts, Lord. Uh, if there is anything that we are doing, we're not doing that, that causes a separation from you, Lord, we just ask for your, humbly ask for your forgiveness this morning. That you would cleanse our hearts, Lord, and that we would be able to start anew and uh, be right with you, Lord that we may be sensitive to your leading in whatever you may call us to do or, or um, want us to hear or see, Lord. Uh, thank you for being our almighty God, our great physician, our heavenly Father, our friend that we can turn to um, whenever we want to talk to you, Lord. Um, thank you for that. And, just continue to be with us as we continue to just sit in your presence and um, worshiping you together, Lord, with our, with our friends and our family here. We come to worship you, almighty God, because there is none like you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. You know, last week we, we took a, a peek into the importance of, of going deeper in our relationship with God, and, and we looked at some, uh, some helpful, like, essential elements of the gospel to, to consider, such as, and I'll, we'll kind of do a recap, uh, such as understanding that the kingdom of God is here. Not just in, in heaven, you know, so we can be free from the bondage of sin from our shortcomings now. You know, we looked at the necessity of, of repentance. You know, understanding that our identity, you know, is to be, to be found in Christ and, and, and what, you know, he's done at the cross because of our shortcomings we also looked at the significance of belief in the gospel where knowledge of the gospel turns to the understanding of it and then with the help of faith transforms into belief. And finally, we looked at the importance of following Jesus. Now, if this is our desire, and I, and I hope it is, that we need to be willing to dive in, you know, to, to go beyond safe, right? The comfortable places that we discuss, places, you know, beyond the surface. And if this is where we're at this morning, well, then, you know, we're in luck because, you know, starting from this week, we, we kind of talked about last week, this week, we'll, you know, we're going to be examining a, a practice, you know, a, the spiritual disciplines for the next three to four weeks, and this morning, you know, this week, we're setting up camp in the discipline, you know, the practice of prayer. 
And so before we, we kind of dive in, let me just kind of uh, open our time with a word of prayer. Let me just pray for us, and we'll, we'll just jump right on in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, just for this morning and this time where we can come and, and be here to worship you freely. Father, we pray that this morning the words that are spoken, they would be yours, God. We pray that you would just bless this time as we worship you, as we give thanks to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> this morning, I'd like for us to, to take a look at, at some rules, you know, uh, or some helps on, on how to dive deeper with God. You know, rules that if practice can put us in a posture that we can know Him, that we can see Him up close and in a more personal way. And so perhaps as a starting point this morning, we need to establish kind of a, a, a point of what prayer is. So let me give you a, a working definition. Prayer, according to the Billy Graham Association, is the spiritual communication between man and God, a two-way relationship in which man should not only talk to God, but also listen to him. Okay? So it's kind of this, this two-way communication, right? You know, so prayer to God is, is like you know, a child's conversation you know, with his father, it, it's this natural. It's natural for a child to ask their father, right? You know, for things that they need. I look at it this. It's kind of like when when our our girls were young. You know, we'd have these conversations, and oftentimes they would be they would be held, um, you know, on two different levels. Okay, and and if you you know. Parents out there, you kind of understand this, right? So, you know, these two different levels. The first level would be us meeting them where they're at. Going down to their level, and that's where the conversation would take place. You know, now that they're adults, it, it, the conversation is at a much higher level. But, but back then, you know, <clears throat> my wife would always lecture me, like, you cannot talk to the kids the way you talk to other people, right? You know, and at that time, I was working with um, convicted felons, right? So it's kind of like a, you know, I would say, okay, what's the deal, right? You know, you cannot, and so, you know, and then I got to put on my, like, uh, even when I was reading stories, you know, I got to make the voices of the, char the characters, right, you know? And, and, and so, you know, you, you're going down to their level. And again, that's where the conversation would take place. But the second would, would be us, you know, as parents, right, you know, using the discernment of a parent to make sure that the outcomes were in their best interest. That their needs would be met over their wants. Because oftentimes for kids, man, there's a lot of wants. But as a parent, the decisions made oftentimes needs will far outweigh the wants. <clears throat> And I believe prayer is kind of like that as we dive deeper, as we grow more with our Heavenly Father, the, the conversations will change. The levels will change. So now that we kind of know what, what, what prayer is, why then should we pray? You know, why is it important? Well, prayer is, you know, a vital part of our, our daily walk. With the Lord. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. And the reason being is because it's the way that we, you know, not only connect with God, but also bring our concerns to Him. Again, prayer is this, this conversation between God and his children. And we need to keep the lines of communication open. No matter what's going on in the world around us, you know, and, and right now in this day and age, I mean, there's so many things going on, and, and because of, you know, the, 
the, the, the internet and getting news at a faster rate. We, 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 we take in all these things, and, and sometimes we get um, distracted. Sometimes we feel like there's too many problems for me to even give, go to God with my problems. But no matter what's going on in the world, it, it's how this relationship, meaning our relationship with the Lord, it's how it continues to grow. In fact, it's, it's how all relationships continue to grow. You know, understanding these two things, I still believe that as, as we look around, we might find ourselves at different places. Meaning that our starting points will all differ. And they'll differ because of where we're at or, or how we see things. That means that our first step, right, you know, is going to be, you know, is going to be on our own. It's going to be a very personal and unique to ourselves. And we may all know what prayer is. We may all know why it's important, but how we begin may differ greatly. The reason I say this is because oftentimes this is dependent on how, how we see God. Now, this is pretty important because not only does God deserve to be known as he's revealed himself to us. And what I mean by that is how, how God has revealed himself to me may, may differ greatly from the next person. You know, and, and, and it probably does, right? And I, and I think I've shared this before where our older daughter who went to California Baptist University had, uh, you know, she would talk to all her, her friends and they would ask her, hey, how does, it, how does it feel? And she's like, what do you mean, how does it feel? And she goes, how does it feel to have like a dad as a pastor? Because this is California Baptist University, right? So, you know, chapel is mandatory. So they're thinking like, okay, what does home look like, right? And, and you know, our older daughter's like, well, you know, I don't, I don't think my dad's like a normal type of pastor, you know? And I don't even know what that means, right? So, you know, it, maybe it means that I'm seeing things differently. But then she went on to say that, um, but you know, really, if you, if you were to come home with me, you might think that my mom's the pastor, you know? <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I, again, I don't know what to make of that, but, but all that to say is that where we're at, we, how we see God will impact how we approach Him in prayer. Now, this is pretty important because, again, God deserves, right, to be known as He's revealed Himself to us. And this will shape every step we take from that point on. You know, it's similar to the saying, first impressions are, are hard to break. If an individual makes a poor impression, then we, we don't think as highly of that person, right? You know, you know, so how do we see God? And I can't, I can't answer that for you. That, that's kind of something that you will have to kind of wrestle with on your own. If we somehow fall under the impression that God needs to be bribed into loving us, and I say that because there are people who do, you know, that, that maybe I, I have to do this or I have to do that in order for God to love me. Or perhaps manipulated into helping us. Well, Lord, you know, if, you know, if I serve in this committee, then could you allow this to happen? Or if I do this, then perhaps you can help me with that. You know, or that we need to be good. And I think a lot of people fall into this category. You know, I have to be good in order for him to hear me. To love me. Or maybe he's just some wish granter only to go to when we're in despair. You know, if this is the case, and, and, I, and I, I don't think it should be, by the way. 
then it will shape the way we see God. It will. And in turn, it will shape the way we pray. There's a popular song on, on the country radio charts, you know, and um, it, it's by this singer-rapper, this guy, Jelly Roll. I, I never even heard of him before, but I was watching the uh, Country Music Awards, and he was on it, and, you know, he was incarcerated, but his, his, how he sees things, and he sings, he has some pretty profound lyrics in, in his music, but, but, but he has this song that I've been listening to, and I think it's, it's perfect for this right here. The song is entitled, Need a Favor, and, and I'll share a loose interpretation because the, the exact lyrics may, is more PG-13 than, and gravitating past that maybe, but, but it goes like this, I only talk to God when I need a favor. And I only pray when I ain't got a prayer. So who am I to expect a Savior when I only go to God when I need a favor? You know, and, and he's talking about his experience in prison. And, and, and oftentimes people view God as this, this, this giant wish granter in the sky. You know, as much as this isn't the nature and image of God, I believe there are, a, there are a lot of us who get caught up in seeing God this way. And so with that said, let, let's turn to Scripture to get a glimpse of the character and image of God. And, and so first, let's turn to Psalm 139, and we're, we're going to kind of fly right through these ten verses. It says this, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar, you discern my, growing, my going out and my lying down, you are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in, be, uh, in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to retain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Here we see a God who's omnipresent, meaning God is everywhere. There's nothing beyond his reach. You know, in Lamentations 3, chapter 3, verses 22 to 23, we see a God who's loving, merciful, forgiving, who's consistent and faithful. It, it says this, verse 22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. <clears throat> so again, how do we see God. And I ask not, you know, because not all of us are, are, will be starting at the same point. Really, no. But a second helpful step might be to explore our understanding of God's image of us. Because there are two things at play here. It is how we see God, but oftentimes another deterrent is how we think God sees us us. Perhaps we need to start by asking the question, what does God think of me? If we think that we're merely an annoyance to God, even though this is not true, this will definitely shape our prayer. And, and you might think that you're not, right? But, but sometimes our actions will, will speak otherwise. And I've heard it where people say, well, you know what, I, I, I don't think this is important to God, this prayer. I, I, I think this is too small. I don't think we, I should do this because, you know, like, well, you know, there are other things. You 
You see, this approach will definitely shape our prayer. And it may even cause us to avoid prayer entirely. God's image of us is that we are completely unique in all of creation. You know, I'm not the same as you. You're not the same as me. But we are equally precious to him. We are worth loving. And some of us this morning, we need to hear that. That we are worth loving in God's sight. Some of us don't believe we're worth loving. Perhaps it's because of the things we've done in the past, you know, unforgivable in our minds, but not God's. Again, listen to Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. The steadfast Lord of the love, uh, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies, they don't ever come to an end. And every morning it's new. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So again, how do we you know, how do we think God sees us? You know, this is a question only we can answer for ourselves. But as we grow in a healthier understanding of what prayer is and, and why we pray, and, and as we grow in, in seeing God for who He is, and also how He sees us, it's there that I believe we're able to kind of break through the surface and dive deeper into the depths of prayer with God. So perhaps the only thing left for us to do is examine how we can deepen this discipline. Now this, you know, as we looked at last week, you know, we looked at kind of diving deep, right? And, and there's no really one set way to, to achieve this, but I'd like to kind of share an approach with you guys this morning. This is, you know, and, and before we introduce this approach, or rather these rules of prayer, I'd just like to, to preface it by saying that we are not, um, that we you were know, exploring these rules, which kind of I happen to like a lot but not rather than the theology of the one who created them. Okay, now in the church world, you know, there are all different types of, we, we've talked about this before, right? There's, there's Arminianism, Calvinism, there's, you know, all these different spectrum, even within our denomination. It goes from, from the extremely conservative to the extremely progressive. And, and so this morning, we are not here to, to discuss theology or debate it. but rather to, to explore how to dive deeper in prayer with God. So we're going to camp out here for the duration of our time together. So, you know, but before we engage these rules, let, let's take a look at two of my favorite passages in, on, you know, on prayer as a foundation to build on. You know, and... You know, and the first is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 to 18. And, it, and we all know it. It says this, verse 16, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The second is found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I, I started with these passages because Scripture is always the foundation, I believe, upon which disciplines are built. As we explore these rules of prayer, let me first pull a few things out of these two passages here. And, it, and first, there's this importance, right, of approaching God. Verse 17 uh, in uh, Thessalonians, it says, pray continually. You know, in Philippians, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, 
you know. So the importance of going to God. You know, and, and that's kind of seems obvious, but if we don't ever go to God, then there's going to be hard to have this conversation with God. Then the way we approach God is important. Rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. You know, how we approach God, it shouldn't be in a, in a, in a manner of, of depression. I mean, like, you know, like, oh. You know, it's kind of like if you have friends and you're pretty sad every time you're going to hang out with your friends, you, you should get new friends. You know, that's just the way it is, right? You know, if, if you're like, oh, man, <sighs> you know, I got I to gotta go hang out with my friends, you know. That's, that's pretty sad, you know. I, I mean, I, you, so, you know, it, it should be this sense of excitement to rejoice. To, man, I get to spend time with the creator of all things of the heavens and the earth, and, and, and he chose me, by the way, and I, and I am amazing in his eyes, and so now I get to hang out and spend time with him. Rejoice. And then the things that we do during our times with God, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We should have this grateful heart. Now, I know we've looked at a lot of things this morning, and we're going to, you know, but hang with me, you know, because we're going to wrap up things with these four rules of prayer. And so these, these practices, these rules of prayer, they come from the French theologian and pastor, this guy, John Calvin. Some of you know John Calvin, you know, and, and and he was a pastor and reformer, reformer in Geneva during the Protestant Refor- Reformation in the 1500s. Um, you know, he's the principal figure in the development of the reform movement of theology. <clears throat> and he stressed the, you know, in his, in his teachings, he stressed the, doc- the doctrine of predestination and his interpretations of, of, of Christian teachings known as Calvinism are, are extremely characteristic in reform churches and those who practice Reformed theology. <clears throat> now, with that said, again, our focus this morning is on prayer and not the promotion of any one theological thought. I think that as we grow with God, you know, I remember talking to a professor in, in seminary, and, and, and I, I, I really enjoyed what his approach was. You know, his whole thing was, you're here to formulate your theology. Because when you go out there, you're not going to have a book to lean on. All you'll have is your relationship with the Lord. And he said, some of you, and I thought this was pretty funny until I, you know, I talked to other people. Some of you are going to go to churches where you're going to need God. You know, he said, uh, you know, and, and, and I didn't know what he meant by that. When I'm just kind of naive, young guy in seminary. And he says, you, you know, and so it'll be the only thing, you know. And so he says, as you, as you spend your time here, my prayer for you guys is you formulate a theology that is deep, you know. And so we're not here to, to, to debate or discuss anything. We're here to explore how to dive deeper in prayer. So let's take a look at these four rules and, and, and how I believe it can impact our prayer lives. The first rule is this, reverence. We, those who go, who go to God in prayer, should recognize who God is as well as who we are, meaning the created coming before the creator. You know, what this means is that in prayer, we need to put ourselves in a place, okay, meaning where our mind and our hearts are at, a place where we're found acceptable in God's eyes. A place that's, that's fitting for those who enter into conversation with Almighty God, the creator of all things. You know, Calvin believes strongly in the importance of a disciplined mind and heart. He believed that we arrive at this place, we approach, you know, we approach prayer, or rather we approach God with a deep sense of, of reverence. As those who are so moved by God's majesty, liberated from earthly cares and, you know, 
affections that often distract us. Okay? Ultimately, it's this understanding of how infinitely big God is and how small we are that allows us to come to prayer with the right posture, which is with reverence for the one who created us, who saved us, who loved us. Okay? And I want us to get that because that's just like the most important thing. And for, for a lot of us, we, we get that in a worldly sense. You know, if you, if you worked in a place where, you know, there is a hierarchy, there are going to be times where you're going to come into a meeting with people who are much higher than you. And how we approach those meetings are going to be way different than how we approach meetings with our peers or those perhaps that are not on the same level as us in the workforce. You know, I, I just, I, I remember working at this Native Hawaiian organization. And, and those people who know me know I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the world's biggest hugger. But, but I had, I had um, one of my assistants, so every time we would go into meetings, I would have to ask him, you know, is this a hugging meeting? You know, is this kind of, you know, because when you, you know, and there would be times where, you know, we're putting our heads next to each other because it's kind of a, a Native Hawaiian thing, right? And I'm just like, okay, you know, because, um, you know, I, I'll do it. This is just not in my comfort zone, but I just got to know that what type of meeting we're entering into. And so Calvin is saying that as we approach God, I mean, it is coming before, you know, this infinite being, this, this creator of the heavens and the earth, and knowing that we're not. Then there's repentance. And the second rule is, you know, is this heartfelt sense of repentance. Calvin says, you know, that we must pray from a sincere sense of want and penitence, maintaining the disposition of a beggar. You know, Calvin uses this word, you know, penitent, to describe the right attitude. You know, to be penitent is to express or feel sorrow for the things that we've done. And the areas in our lives where we've fallen short for, you know, for Calvin, it, it's okay to ask for things if we ask with a sincere sense of want and, and a right understanding of God. Prayer in, in Calvin's eyes is, again, is a reminder of how insufficient we are. You know, here it's, it's the sense of leaning on God. And we're leaning on God because we cannot sustain standing on our own. The third rule that Calvin shares is humility. And Calvin believed that true prayer requires, requires that we yield all confidence in ourselves and humbly plead for pardon, trusting in God's mercy alone for blessings both spiritual and temporal, always remembering that the smallest drop of faith is more powerful than unbelief. Perhaps because the humble prayer dismisses, diminishes all smugness and entitlement. You know, and all that's left for us is to lean on God's mercy for us. You know, think about that. You know, for this reason, Calvin argues it's fitting that we begin our prayers to God by repenting of individual sins in our lives that, that hinder us. Any other approach to God promotes a sense of pride, you know, which can be extremely detrimental to our approach to God. Perhaps this is what Henry Nouwen, and if you, you know, Henry Nouwen is this author and Catholic priest, but, but he has a lot of really deep, spiritually deep writings. And, and I believe this is what Henry Nouwen was thinking about when he wrote his book with open hands. In his book, 
now it encourages individuals, and, and this is a posture of prayer that I, that I, for me, it's been life-changing in a sense, right? You know, to, to approach God with open hands. Now, you might be thinking like, okay, you know, well, I'll start to pray like this or like this. And, and now, and as I read through this, it, it, it made perfect sense to me. Because this whole thing is, why do we go to God oftentimes with clenched fists? Right? Because clenched fist, fist is a defensive posture. It's kind of holding people back. You know, it's, it's this sense of, of, of distancing ourselves from others. But with open hands, you know, we come, right, willing to receive whatever God has in store for us. You know, it's, it's not saying that we're too good for that. It's saying that, man, whatever you have, God, I want. So may we humble ourselves as we approach the Lord. And Calvin's final rule is this, confident hope. You know, in the midst of how we approach God, meaning with this deep sense of humility, right? Calvin shared that that we should be nonetheless encouraged to pray by a sure hope hope that our prayer would be answered, okay? You know, so this is not arrogance. He's saying that in the midst of our humility, as considering ourselves less than, right? He's big, we're small, we're coming before him. And and even though as we're humbling ourselves, there's this confident hope that what we ask will be answered, You know, and, and, and it's similar to like what we started from, right? We're having that conversation with your kids, right? When they're young, they think that you can do anything. Newsflash, dad cannot, right? You know, I mean, but they don't know that. They think that, man, you know, their parents can, 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 can move mountains for them. You know, don't let our approach to God affect our confidence and hope in God. And this is directly in line with with Calvin's theology, right? You know, which is the right understanding of the majesty of God. That he's big, and we're small. That he's God, and we're not. In this past week, I was on the island of Maui in, in Lahaina um, from Tuesday to Thursday, um, meeting with the, the interim pastor at Lahaina Baptist Church, as well as some, some families that were impacted by the, the wildfires. And, you know, as, as the pastor, he, as he drove me around, you know, I, I began to get a firsthand look you know, at the devastation that those fires caused. I had just seen pictures. I would seen the news. I hadn't seen it. And, 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 and there were subdivisions that, you know, that all that was left were just rubbles up to about this high. And, and at first glance, it really looked just like a graveyard. You know, it was, it was heartbreaking. And I say this because, you know, this was beyond, you know, Anything I could, I could have grasped, and, and as I prayed, you know, um, as I, you know, went back to my room, and I had some time, I was writing, and, I was, and as, as I began to pray, I, I you know, I, I say this because I, I really didn't have words at first. And so all I could do was rely on this fact that there is this confident Hope that even though I cannot even formulate the words, that God knows, that God can. Because in the midst of of my smallness and my lack of understanding as to where where do we begin? You know, how do we try and, and help? 
my prayers were just thrown out and directed to a God who, who was much bigger than the finite thoughts in my head. A God who is infinitely wiser. And I can tell you that at least that glimpse gives me hope. In James chapter 1, verse 6, it says this, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. You know, it's saying that in the lives of believers, it's, it is faith and hope that conquers all fear. We may not have the words, we may not have the thoughts, we may not even have the understanding, but if we have faith and we have hope, We don't have to fear that God won't hear us, because he will. You see, this is the confident hope that's rooted in what Jesus did at the cross, that we're encouraged to pray with. You know, these four rules, they are not, they are not the way, but they are a way. To pray. And I say this because there are many ways out there to approach God in prayer. And, and I don't know if there's one way that's more right than another. But the one consistent and, and the most important is that we approach God. That we go to Him in prayer. That it is, it is important that we make time for Him. You know, we can't exercise any of these rules or practice any posture if we don't actually come before God in prayer. And I'm just saying, because sometimes we can, we can know all the right things, but unless we make time to go to God and spend time with God, all of this really means nothing. Now, if you're like me, and, and maybe you have a problem with the word rules, because I do at times, you know, and, and so if so, change it up. You know, if our desire is to dive deeper with God in prayer, then use this as a guide, you know, or, or some tips to dive deeper, you know, because sometimes people are like, rules, oh, I'm not about rules, cancel, can't do that. But, but these are like tips. These are a guide, a, a way that can help us dive deeper. You know, whatever the term we use, the goal is to engage. You know, to approach, to spend time with God in prayer consistently. The more time we spend with God, the closer we get to Him. And the closer we get to Him, the deeper our times of prayer become. You know, let me leave us with these words from the Apostle Paul, <clears throat> found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 to 18. <clears throat> Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are grateful to you. And Father, as we come this morning, as we've sat, as we've listened, as we've prayed, as we've sung, God, our prayer is that you would somehow show us who you are to us. That you would show us how much we mean to you. And Father, may that be the starting point as how we begin to approach you to to dive deeper in our relationship with you. So Father, that's our that's our prayer this morning. And, and God, our hope is, is that that as we take that one step forward, that you would use that and you would grow that and you would just allow us. God, to see you in a more personal, intimate way. Take us to the depths. God, that's our prayer, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name.
So glad that you were here this morning to worship with us, both in person as well as, as online. Um, and I encourage you guys to speak a word of welcome to one another. Um, you know, we are just we're just glad that that we to be in in God's house. Um, let me offer up our benediction for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you again this morning. And Father, we thank you for your word and how it is this food, God, for our soul. May we be diligent in how we, we, we take it in. May we be faithful in how we communicate with you. And so now we ask that you dismiss us, God, with your peace and your love. But we humbly pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week.